It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Pele Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Well, happy Monday. Thanks so much for tuning in here to start your week on this May Day. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yenji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we turn our attention back to Red Hill. That's right. We are speaking with a familiar face this morning. We want to welcome Ernie Lau, the Chief Engineer of the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Yenji and Ryan. It's so good to see you. Uh, we have a lot to cover with you today, but we want to start with Red Hill. If you could update us, because a lot of folks have not been keeping close track, but we know you are, on the progress being made by the Navy on those repairs and how that will you th how you think that will impact the overall timeline for the defueling process. Yeah, thank you. There's uh, still 104 million gallons of diesel and jet fuel stored in Red Hill in those old tanks that were, were built uh, 80 years ago right over our drinking water aquifer. The Navy's actively working through the, the what they call the Joint Task Force to do the necessary repairs to accomplish defueling by some middle of next year. So there are about 253 different repairs that need to get completed. And I believe the Navy is uh, over halfway through those, that list of 253 repairs. And just to your knowledge, and I'm not sure you know the answer to this, but do you know if this is on target with what they expect it to be in terms of uh, just the overall repairs? Uh, we know that they have laid out a timeline of when they wanted to have all of these done. Do you think that they are on schedule, behind schedule? Your overall thoughts about the progress they're making thus far with these repairs? Well, you know, they tell me that they're on schedule and uh, I want to hold them to it. I would actually encourage and I continue to encourage them to see if they can accelerate that schedule to defuel even sooner than middle of next year. Uh, but according to the Navy, uh, they're still on schedule. They recently created a dashboard. If you go to the Joint Task Force website, you can look at their dashboard, which gives you an update on where they're at on their schedule. So you know cross our fingers. Let's talk about the contamination itself. We know that you have uh, the Board of Water Supply has a number of monitoring wells trying to track where that contamination has gone. Do you have any insights as to where that plume may be and how it may be, you know, affecting our environment? Uh, so at the right now, we only have a couple monitor wells and we're working to drill more monitor wells. Uh, Navy is also drilling more monitor wells. And these new monitor wells are going to be positioned outside of Navy property primarily uh, to give us an idea where things might be spreading. The monitor wells that are primarily within Navy property, uh, what I've heard from the regulators uh, and the Navy, it seems like those levels are declining. Uh, but to me, that doesn't mean that the contamination is disappearing. It's just moving with the groundwater in, in directions where there are no monitor wells right now. So we suspect it might be moving off of Navy property, either to the west or to the east. One of the things that you had mentioned uh, on last time that you were on here and spoke was just the access that you had to some of the um, what was at the time uh, agreed upon areas where you would be able to go on, even if on Navy property to do some of these testings, but uh, got some pushback from the military saying that they weren't going to necessarily give the Board of Water Supply access to these areas to conduct testing of their own uh, of your own uh, on their sites. How has that uh, been resolved or has it been resolved and how is that information that they're get, gathering about some of these testing being shared with the Board of Water Supply? And is there a level of transparency that you are satisfied with? I, I think there's an improvement in, in terms of transparency that we have the ability now to actually hold regular face-to-face -face meetings with the three admirals in charge of the Red Hill situation. Vice Admiral John uh, Wade, Vice uh, Rear Admirals uh, Stephen Barnett and Steve uh, Jeffrey Killian. Uh, and we kind of share our monotony with each other. Uh, transparency or access to the information is still problematic for us. Uh, back last year, they asked us uh, to get access to some of our wells to draw samples and test the water. And we really accommodated them to do that uh, with the understanding that we would 
also be able to have the favor returned to us so that we could get access to some of the Navy's monitor wells, including Red Hill Shaft, to take water samples and run tests. Unfortunately, they kind of reneged on that. Uh, and that still remains where we're at right now. Uh, just last week, uh, I had a chance to talk to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, uh, Meredith Berger, uh, and uh, got a chance to reiterate my concerns about that, uh, asking for her cocoa to uh, make it possible that we can start to board a water supply can start to access their wells for sampling and testing. And what kind of a response did you get? What is the reason given, especially given that this was initially agreed upon and that you are willing to share access on your side to the data? Um, what What is the reason given on their side as to why that is not, you know, reciprocated? It wasn't clear, it just uh, it seemed like that was a, a matter that maybe is illegal, not allowing third party access to their wells uh, to sample and test, which is for me was uh, very disappointing, um, being the fact that uh, they asked us for a favor, we granted it, we asked for the same return treatment and uh, we were denied. We continue to press on that issue. Um, and hopefully someday we'll be able to do that. And I just wanted to follow up on, on just the overall transparency. And, and, you know, because we know this was such a big issue and a large part of how we got to this situation and, and the distrust that the military is trying to gain back with the community because of some of the information that may have not been readily available to you and to other stakeholders involved in this process. Um, you, you say that it is getting better. How else can it improve? I mean, is there certain things beyond just what you mentioned that you would like to hear from the military that you are still looking out for or ways to improve this overall um, collaboration between both entities, but also just to help gain the respect and transparency back and, and a, a level of confidence from the community? You know, I'll give you a, an easy example. Uh, there was an AFFF uh, concentrate liquid spill back in November 29th of 2022 just outside of Adit 6, which is a side tunnel off the Red Hill, uh, lower tunnels that carry the field pipelines and, uh, to Pearl Harbor. Uh, that investigative report uh, is still not released, made public, along with the video that goes along with it. Uh, so that's an example, I think, what they can take a step to improve transparency. Uh, we've been on this uh, Red Hill situation for since 2014. And it's always been a battle to get a complete understanding of what's happening at this facility, its problems, its challenges, how much has been spilled over the years. Uh, it's been, in a way, like pulling teeth. Uh, so I, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement here. One of the things that came out just recently with the Office of the Inspector General's report, uh, the OIG for the EPA, they conducted an evaluation of Region 9 which is the region nine is the uh, area of the, of the EPA that is responsible, including Hawaii and the Pacific and the West Coast. Um, I think one of the recommendations there that they need to improve transparency, improve communication uh, to the community and make information and the ideas of risk uh, much more understandable to, to everybody, including the Board of Water Supply. Uh, I think that is one area if they want uh, the military wants to build trust it's a low hanging fruit release the report from November 29 2022 make the information that we've requested readily available and um, uh, don't uh, bury it in files that are are huge PDF files uh, or summary spreadsheets that are of questionable accuracy. Hmm. Have you been given any kind of a time frame as to when you might be able to get access to that information? No, we don't have any time frame for that. Um, we have seen recently that the EPA is working to create a dashboard of their own that will allow the community to be able to access the this uh, test data more easily. Uh, and that's supposed to come out later this year, uh, released by the EPA. Uh, we're going to provide some feedback to the EPA, but one of the questions I will have for, of the EPA when I meet with them is, are you sure you're getting accurate information from the Navy, full and complete information, and uh, to be able to present uh, information that is uh, trustworthy uh, and, and accurate? 
uh, because you know the old saying is garbage in garbage out uh, so if the data is not high quality data uh, and it goes into this um, this um, uh, dashboard that the EPA is working on uh, it'll be confusing and misleading to the community so they need to ensure data integrity here you know, a lot, I know a lot of the focus right now is, of course, on the repairs and the, the feeling process, but there also have been conversation about what happens to the Red Hub facility beyond. Uh, you know, when we spoke to military officials, they say that this is going to be something that they will seek the public's interest and uh, ideas in and that they were going to put together a plan, but have not really committed or publicly stated what they would like to do with this facility. Uh, as you have these conversations, is the future of Red Hill coming up? of what this facility could be? And, and has there been any talk amongst your discussions about what they envision Red Hill to be used for moving forward? Well, in our discussions from the very beginning on this closure plan is that they simply want to close in place, which is, I, from my, my perspective, clean up the pipes, clean up the tanks, uh, but leave everything in place. Uh, they are, they ha have hired a consultant to do a survey on beneficial reuse of the facility. But I, I, and they came in to interview me and I told them very succinctly, uh, this facility needs to be permanently shut down and disabled to the point that it can never, you can never bring any kind of fuel storage back into that facility, regardless of the circumstances here in the Pacific, uh, because it, we cannot risk this situation being repeated some point in the future putting all this fuel right over our drinking water aquifer. You know, right at the start of our conversation, you did say, uh, you know, and you reminded us that there are still 104 million gallons of fuel. Um, when we've talked to you, you know, sitting above our aquifer right at this moment, we've, when we've talked to you about this in the past, you have expressed that this does keep you up at night. And, and given the long time frame, I mean, tell us about your concerns with that fuel still sitting there right now. There has been progress, as you noted, with the repairs. But what are your concerns about a possible spill between the time it takes for them to make the pipes available to actually drain that fuel and now? Yanji, as long as it's there, I, I, I have trouble sleeping. You know, last night, I, actually thinking about this interview got me a little nervous. So I, uh, I woke up like at 2 a.m. last night thinking about the AFFF spill, uh, the 1,300 gallons of the AFFF with PFAS concentrate spill at Red Hill. And uh, thinking how awful an awful event that was for our environment, for our water resource in the area. So it, it is, um, I won't rest easy until the last drop of fuel is out of every tank and every pipeline there at Red Hill. And they also get rid of their AFFF uh, and they clean up. And what's very important, they need to clean up the mess they left behind, uh, no matter how long it takes, no matter what the cost might be. One of the things that we always uh, sort of talk about, too, is, is the price tag to this uh, mess. And, every, you know, all of that, uh, the Board of Water Supply is having to do to uh, mitigate all of these efforts, as well as just looking for other facility, uh, other resources, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I want to uh, focus in here on, on just the overall price tag and budgeting. We, we spoke to the congressional delegation who know, obviously, the importance of this and are talking as well to military officials. Uh, have you had continued discussion with the congressional delegation about uh, this effort uh, that's underway to defuel Red Hill, the price tag that it's going to cost, and how the U.S. government as a whole may be able to uh, offset, of, obviously, and pay for some of these damages and some of these repairs that need to be uh, that are currently underway? Uh, we have. Uh, we've actually submitted some of the uh, congressional set. Uh, uh, I think it's called set aside funding uh, for uh, to our congressional delegation, uh, Senator Schatz and uh, Congressman Case, uh, trying to get some federal funds, whether it's for Red Hill directly or indirectly for some other BWS uh, capital project that can help uh, offset some of the costs that we're expending on Red Hill. Uh, so we see that we need to continue to do this uh, to pursue federal funding uh, hopefully in the form of grants as opposed to low interest loans uh, to um, to offset some of the cost impacts of Red Hill. Just an update on the uh, new well development process. I think a, a while back I told you that our plan was to look for six new wells. Uh, we identified six potential locations. 
I'll tell you uh, our experience uh, now, months, almost a year later, is what we're finding is uh, only probably two out of the six locations are viable, are going to be viable to pursue uh, drilling an exploratory well and potentially developing a, per a permanent replacement well. The other four, because of site constraints, drainage issues, or other things, are not going to be developable for, by the Board of Water Supply. So that means, you know, we need to continue our, our search for more well locations, uh, probably going more westward uh, to find new wells. When you were doing that exploration, you know, how many of those six do you need to make up the difference? You know, did you, it, two, it doesn't sound like two is enough. Did you need all six to make up the difference between what was shut down? We, we were hoping that with six and depending on how much water we find at each of those locations in terms of million gallons a day from that location, that might be able to make up the majority of the capacity that currently shut down. But what we're finding is uh, only two out of the six are really actually uh, feasible to pursue uh, drilling an exploratory well and potentially developing. Uh, because of that, we have to continue to look further for new locations. Um, what's happened is we've, we've had to go further up the hill at higher elevations. So these wells are now becoming deeper. Uh, and also the sites that we have, which is our facilities. And I thought, well, we go after property we already own. We don't, have, we don't have landowner issues or land access issues. We're finding that the sites are actually uh, too small to actually accommodate the equipment needed to drill a well. Um, and because of other issues, uh, we've had to give up on at least four of the sites now. And I know that each location is different, but just generally, how long does that process take from uh, you know, maybe establishing where a potential site may be, doing the actual drilling, being able to examine the, the quality of the water, uh, you know, in, in looking ahead, if, if only two are available, how long do you think it will take before you potentially find uh, maybe some other viable resources? I've always used kind of a general rule of thumb, and, and uh, this is not a hard and fast rule, but a general rule, that it's someplace between five to seven years to get a new well. So you first pick the site, go through the whole permitting process, uh, get landowner approvals, apply for the permits, uh, and uh, start to drill and test the site, uh, test the well. And uh, if it's viable, we have enough water, uh, quantity and quality is good at that location, then we pursue to design a permanent pumping facility at that location. So five to seven years, um, but it's to me, it's looking more like seven years is probably more realistic for us. Uh, so this gives us a situation where uh, we still need the cocoa of our community uh, to conserve water, especially during the summer months. Yeah, and let's talk about that in just a moment. But I, I do want to clarify one thing, and that is, you know, we've talked about the Halava Shaft, the, the areas that have been shut down, and you had said that was indefinite. It sounds like that is permanent. Am I, am I reading that right? Well, it's indefinite. Um, the permanency, I think, will come when we drill more monitor wells. We plan to drill some even on the Halava Shaft property uh, and in Halava Valley. Uh, if we find uh, contamination uh, and it's our, and to us it's evidence that it's migrating uh, westward across the valley from Red Hill, then I, I think the decision on permanent shutdown uh, might be uh, in order. We are also doing a water treatment study for Halava Shaft, which if, if you invite me back in maybe uh, June or so of this year or July, I'll be, be able to give you an update on the treatment study to see if water treatment for petroleum contamination, but also now for PFAS contamination is going to be viable um, at that location. Well, it is May 1st, uh, and so we're well into spring, moving into summer, although <laughs> here in Hawaii, it kind of always feels like summer <laughs> at this point. Uh, but, you know, you noted that as we head into the summer months, there are oftentimes, you know, we do find ourselves uh, at a water sh shortage or or having to make those efforts. And this was before uh, this contamination of Red Hill. And so uh, looking into this summer and knowing what has what is available in terms of the aquifers and your resources and reserves, uh, do you foresee any sort of regulations or just a message to the community about conser conservation of water? Uh, how worried are you as we head into the summer months? Uh, well, there's a couple of factors. Uh, right now, what we saw, and we've had a 
bunch of rain recently in the last few months, uh, although it, you know, still some of it was below normal yet. Uh, and water demand, how much we have to produce uh, to meet the demands of our customers island-wide dropped to like 124 million gallons a, a day uh, last month, which is uh, well below the five-year monthly average uh, for this time of the year. Um, I think that's a good place to be as we head into summer. Uh, so that my hope is that in summer we'll still just be in voluntary conservation uh, with our customers and hopefully avoid anything beyond that. Uh, we do, the board did adopt a water shortage plan last year. Uh, so there are triggers based on hours a day out of a 24 hour day, our water pumps have to operate. Uh, and that'll tell us as we, if we need to implement uh, more stringent measures. But for now, I, I would say everybody's doing a good job taking shorter showers, uh, fixing those leaks, replacing old toilets. You know, we have a toilet rebate program now that's getting really popular. Uh, get a high efficiency toilet and you'll get some money back from the Board of Water Supply to help offset some of the cost. So uh, keep up the good work. Uh, that's what my word to the customers. Yeah, and with that in mind, what do some of those triggers look like? You know, if people don't do the things you're talking about, what are the what are the next steps? So it moves it moves from voluntary conservation, uh, and the the more the pumps have to run to keep up with the water demand as the demand increases, especially during the hot, dry summers, then as we approach 20 hours. Um, we start to implement more stringent measures uh, into re maybe restricting outdoor irrigation, uh, maybe restricting car washing, um, uh, restricting uh, how what days of the week you could um, um, run your irrigation system uh, based on your address. Those could become measures uh, that we might implement. Um, so it goes from voluntary toward actually uh, mandatory restrictions. But when we do enter into mandatory restrictions, I do want to make it very clear. It's something that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we'll go in front of the water board, uh, hold a public hearing about it, I'll let people know ahead of time uh, to give everybody an opportunity to reduce their water use and avoid getting into that situation. But it'll be a very public process. You know, as we, there's a lot of talk about climate change and the impacts of the environment and, and overall sustainability. You know, the, the term desalinization and that process is often brought up as a, co a combatant to uh, sea level rising as well as just water shortage overall. Uh, we know that there is uh, an effort underway here on the island of Oahu to, be, to start up a desalinization plant. But I'm wondering if you can just talk to our viewers about and educate us about this process, because while it is a step in the direction uh, there still is, it's a pretty cumbersome, from what I understand, process that is not necessarily going to take the place of what uh, the Halava Shaft provided with its reservoir. But uh, if you can give us an update on the desalination, desalinization plant and overall its impact and how much of a difference will that make in Oahu's overall water efforts? Uh, so the groundwater will always be our primary source of drinking water for our community. Um, our groundwater depends on how much rain falls on the island. Uh, that tells us how much water we can pump safely out of the ground. Uh, but it's also very uh, susceptible and fragile because it, it's something that could be easily contaminated by such activities such as uh, like the Red Hill situation or with uh, PFAS chemicals, AFFF concentrate liquid spilling on the ground. Um, desalination is a very complicated process. Um, we are going through a process right now to develop our first seawater desalination plant on Oahu. We already do a reverse osmosis desalination for wastewater, uh, and we use that for industrial use. Like the Kahe power plant for Hawaiian Electric uses RO desalinated wastewater out of Honoli Uli wastewater treatment plant uh, to supply its uh, high, high quality water needs to generate power. Uh, but we want to now look at desalinating seawater desalination to make that water drinking water for our community. Uh, it is a very challenging process, and we believe we have that uh, capability right now in this project. Uh, and it is also being very going to be very expensive, but we think it's a step in the right direction. It will start off small at 1.7 million gallons a day, uh, because what we're going to do is take 
desalinated seawater, which is very low in minerals, we're going to need to make sure that when we put it into our water system, which has only seen well water up to this point, which is high in minerals, that it doesn't create any water quality problems when the both waters meet in our pipes and create any problems for our customers. So we actually have to make sure the waters are compatible quality uh, so that they can, so our customers won't see any water quality problems. Um, it's going to be expandable to 5 million gallons a day uh, and um, provide us uh, a, another tool, another resource option instead of being 100% dependent on groundwater. I want to point out right now that um, uh, San Diego County uh, gets about 10% of their drinking water from seawater desalination right now. And they've done that because you've seen the impacts of long-term drought in California. Uh, they, although they had recently a lot of flooding, a lot of rain, uh, but they're preparing for the future. Likewise, seawater desalination for us, I think is a step in preparation for resiliency for the future. And, and how soon could we see that come online? How soon could we actually be drinking this water? So the, if everything goes on schedule and uh, you can ask me in a few years, uh, the same question, uh, you were projecting two to three years to get the seawater plant up and running. Okay, and just for you know, for people to have sort of a, a reference point, how much water did we lose when we lost Halava Shaft and had to shut that down uh, versus the up to five million gallons you were talking about per day that we could gain? Halava from Shaft by itself, which is it's a very sad situation because that was like a ten million gallon a day source. Uh, built 1940 in the mid 1940s um, that we currently have shut down. So you can compare how large a, a facility that was. Well, understandably, so why uh, you know the Board of Water Supply is looking for those efforts and those other wells to hopefully try to um, fill and make up for some of that loss. We are just a few minutes uh, from the top of the hour. Uh, our time goes so quickly because there's so much information and updates when we talk to you. Uh, but your message this morning to viewers, uh, you know, we know that this will be an ongoing issue. And sometimes with some of these issues, there seems to be just overall fatigue uh, in terms of just red health fatigue, just knowing and trying to stay updated with all the information that continues to change. Uh, and this will be a lengthy process. What is your message this morning to those watching out there who may not be as up to date with things that are going on and just your overall hopes? as you move forward uh, into this, finding a solution for this issue. So my message is everybody, please hang in there. Uh, please continue to uh, monitor and stay involved in this situation. Uh, it is something like I've been at it now for nine years. And when I started, my hair was black. Uh, now it's getting whiter and whiter every year. Um, but don't give up. And because this, the situation of Red Hill is not just this current generation, it will be the next generation to also deal with, uh, especially on the remediation or cleanup of the aquifer uh, from the contamination. Because Red Hill, remember, um, they had their 14 to 20,000 gallon leaks, uh, spills in uh, 2021 and 2022. Um, in the past, they uh, may have leaked 180,000 gallons plus of fuel into the environment. And it's something we're going to be dealing with for a long, long time. So hang in there. Don't give up. Uh, it's also very important that we all continue to work together as a community, uh, be of one mind and one voice. Okay. Ernie Lau, Chief Engineer for the Board of Water Supply for Honolulu. We always appreciate your time. Thank you for all of the updates this morning. Mahalo. Thank you. Aloha. Always really interesting to hear from Ernie Lau. We know so many in our community really respect his voice. And, it, you know, it's just so interesting to hear because he's tracking so many things at the same time. Uh, you heard there some hope uh, in terms of his relationship with the Navy. He's saying that things are improving, that he has more access uh, and that there is a little bit more information sharing. But that said, um, that well issue that he had talked about with us a couple of months ago, the fact that the, Na that the Board of Water Supply has given access on the Honolulu Lulu side, but that the Navy has not responded in kind is still very frustrating. Um, 
And he's not getting a lot of answers as to if that will ever be changed or why that is the case. Yeah, and he also asked for just more level of transparency, of course, with the spill that happened in November. He says that uh, there's still some information and some footage, some video footage that has not yet been released uh, by the military about this and saying that this is one way to very easily ga gain some of that trust back from the public is being able to release some of those uh, reports and findings uh, to see how that may have impacted the groundwater or anything else in the area. Uh, you also heard him talk about the efforts to find some of those new wells and just that process that it will take, saying five to seven years from the point of maybe identifying a, spot, a space to uh, acknowledging that this is a suitable source of new water uh, and then being able to go down and, and take those tests. Uh, so it does take some time. And they had initially identified potential, uh, six potential areas, but saying now that only two uh, are moving forward in that process and their search continues for more. Yeah, that is somewhat discouraging because, of course, he did outline just how time consuming that is and also how expensive that potentially is. He's still trying to work with the congressional delegation to make sure that those are covered with federal grant monies and not necessarily with loans, because ultimately uh, we, the ratepayers, are the ones who are going to have to foot the bill if the federal government does not step in and take care of that. Um, you know, he talked about being able to track. The Navy now has a dashboard. They've made about half of their more than 200 pair repairs that need to be made to the system to get that drainage going. Um, and in the meantime, he said that 104 million gallons of fuel still sitting atop our aquifer right now uh, keeps him up at night. You know, that's the thing about Ernie Lau that always, uh, you know, strikes me. And I know it strikes you too, Ryan, is just how passionate he is about these issues and, and how personally he takes them. He's really, you know, takes his responsibility as the chief engineer to heart. And, um, and I think that's why we all appreciate when he shares his time with us. Yeah, we know no doubt that he is working hard on this issue, which also includes keeping uh, the public aware of just the overall levels. He's saying heading into the summer, things look good because it has been fairly rainy here on the island of Oahu and there have built up some reserves and there is no cause for any immediate alarm, but just asking for the voluntary conserve, uh, conservation efforts by individuals saying that water use is actually down at this point in time right now compared to what is the norm for this time of the year uh, and hoping that the island will be able to sustain all its needs as we head into the hotter, uh, more warm summer months. We also got an update on the desalinization process and that plant, which uh, could come online. Uh, hopefully it, it, things continue to move forward uh, and that can be an additional source. Uh, but you really heard how technical things can get with adding in uh, desalinized water from the ocean and uh, mixing it with the groundwater saying there that they have to find and uh, ensure that the minerals from both of these water supplies uh, are in line and something that they will continue to test but always great to hear from him and, and i'm sure we'll hear from him again in the future yeah. if not very soon <laughs> he is always welcome back uh we are going to talk about food insecurity in hawaii on wednesday we'll be speaking to the head of the food bank along with the folks at hawaii apple seed uh just talking about how many people in our community are really vulnerable right now we saw a lot of that at the height of the pandemic when so many people lost their jobs and you saw those long lines outside of Aloha Stadium, the food bank really stepping up and giving food to so many people in our community. Uh, that kind of high, you know, acute need is not there now, but there are still thousands of people in our community, including quite a few children who don't have the food that they need. We're going to be talking about what the landscape is like here, how it compares to the continent, and what we can all do to help out. So we hope you join us for another conversation here on Spotlight Hawaii 1030 on Wednesday. We'll see you then. Aloha.